truth is most of us can barely control ourselves. We cannot control other people. I mean, it is, I think, the ultimate human dilemma. Even if we're right and they're wrong, even if they'd be happy if they did what we said, (laughs) we can't make them do it. Welcome back to another episode of the Mark Groves Podcast. Today, I am joined by exceptional author, Melody Beattie. Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have learned enough about technology to actually be here on time. That (laughs) makes me happy. I learned that during COVID. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to do that because your book, Codependent No More, touched my life, oh my gosh, probably about eight years ago. And I felt like um, no one had put in such succinct words uh, what that dynamic really is like. I know that 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 terminology originally sort of formed in um, Al-Anon. And so Mm -hmm. I was just so grateful that you took what was an obvious pattern relationally and made it consumable for people who weren't just dealing with an alcoholic. So thanks for putting those, those, those words on a page. I I did it very selfishly to save my own life. (laughs) It's so easy to drown in other people's stuff, to just start drowning and not even know what's killing you you know, to just get lost in it. And all of a sudden you go, where did my life go? Do I have a life? Is there a life for me? What am I doing that's creating this? And it can be absolutely stupefying when it, when it hits us. It's like, this isn't my metaphor and everyone's probably heard it, but it's, if you put a frog in boiling water, it will jump out. It won't stay. But if you put a frog in cold water and slowly turn up the heat, it will stay in there and boil to death. And that's what happens to most codependents. They're boiling to death in their relationships. They don't know what's going on. The heat got turned up and they don't know how to get out. Yeah, there seems to be in that pattern, it's hard to see yourself in it, I guess, like most patterns, you know, and I like that uh, analogy of it being a slow cook because it almost feels like when you start in a relationship like that, I think often the code, the side that's trying to please or solve or heal or fix or whatever it is, I think we kind of get caught in the self image of that too. Like the altruistic sort of, I'm helping, I'm saving, I'm healed, they're not. Is that something that, like, what? yeah, what do you think about that? You know, there's such fine lines between being human and being obnoxiously codependent. (laughs) I've probably fallen over that line a few times. I mean, when we meet someone, we want to be helpful. We want to care. We're interested in them. And we want to express our affections for them. But at some point, we don't have an off switch that goes, how much are you giving? Are you receiving? And does this feel right to you? Does this feel good to you? We do, and, and red flags, we're horrible with red flags. <laughs> we're like bulls. We think, oh, let me at them. <laughs> right? It's so true. We see it and we're like, I'm going to go towards it. It's going to be different this time. This will Yeah, it'll be different and it'll be exciting. <laughs> yeah, it'll be hot. It'll be yeah. hot. It's yeah. interesting because that also feeds arousal often, which I find is, you know, an interesting when we start to eroticize our pain and then use arousal, like the pain comes and then we experience arousal and our nervous system then gets calmed a bit through the connection. But then we're but through the dopamine connection yeah. that follows. Yeah. We we create our own trauma so we can dopamine it out. But and, and that doesn't work as a long term plan for a marriage or a relationship whether it's with a child or whether it's with a lover. So what fuel, I know you said that you wrote that book in a way to save your own life. So can you give us some context to that? Because I know you've written many books now. Well, the the history of that statement is this. Um, I came from a very dysfunctional family myself, which many of us have. And I ended up, uh, a judge sentenced me to treatment at age 23. I still remember when he asked me, Do you know that you're responsible for your own behavior? And if I would have been honest, I would have said no. (laughs) Wow. Because I I never learned that. Nobody ever sat me down and said, if you do A, B will happen. Um, I I was not raised with cause and effect. Just You're just like your father. He's an alcoholic. I mean, the, the patterning taught me what to do. 
you know, so I thought, well, mom doesn't love me, so I'll use drugs and drink and then maybe, and then maybe I can find my dad and he'll love me. Well, that didn't happen either. So I just went about my own thing of becoming addicted and I ended up in treatment sent there by a judge when I was 23 years old. And um, I found everything I needed for the rest of my life in that treatment wow. center. Um, I found my spirituality. I found out what was wrong with me. I found out what I needed to do to heal and stay on a track the rest of my life. And I spent eight months in treatment and I didn't really even want to leave. It was like, that was my true home. And my counselor, bless her soul, Ruth Anderson. I mean, she showed me such unconditional love when I was there. So like many other recovering addicts, and the the whole thing of recovery addiction was new to young people back then. I mean, it was on fire back in Minnesota. It was just, AA was open to young people. Nobody was really talking about Al-Anon because that's not attractive. (laughs) (laughs) that's not as sexy as having the rock bottom yourself yeah so I got out of treatment and I was so inspired I wanted to help other addicts the way my counselor had helped me the way this program had helped me I wanted to help them find themselves they're everything because really if you're an addict recovery is everything So I started applying for, you know, I went through the drill. I waited two years. I took a course at the University of Minnesota um, to become a counselor. But that was different times back then. That was in the early 70s. And there weren't that many women working in treatment, not in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I, I flash forward a few more months. I had met and was dating a man, David Beatty, by then. and he and his brothers had started most of the treatment centers in the state of Minnesota, not Hazleton, not any of those, but the um, therapeutic communities and different places. And so after watching me unsuccessfully try and get hired as a counselor, David said, well, talk to Lorraine, who ran their program at Eden House. And so I went to work for Eden House as a secretary. (laughs) and one day Lorraine came in and she said to me with our new government funding unless we start doing something for the families of the addicts we're going to lose our funding and I looked at her I said I mean visions of my mother crossed through my mind (laughs) I said "I, I, I don't know what to do with them you know what would I do with the family members I said I'm new here she said well we don't know either and that's why you get the job. So she tasked me with <laughs> figure dealing. It out. Yeah, figure it out. So I did. And I took it very serious. It was never my dream to become the codependency lady. That was <laughs> <laughs> that was not in that your was, childhood. Uh, that was that was <laughs> not even in my adulthood dreams. <laughs> yeah, I guess no one thinks like, oh yeah, I want to be known for healing codependency at the time when you're in the grips or witnessing it, you're kind of like, I just want to be done with it. I did. I just really, really wanted to be, I wanted that part of my life to be over, but it didn't go away, you know? And that magic that happens, they, they call it the wounded healer phenomena began to take place in the groups. And I could hear while the women in the group were telling their stories I could go, wow, my husband does the same. I mean, I could see the comparison in my own life on different levels. Like one woman had had what she had five kids and her husband had been to prison two times and she ended up de- ended up dying of natural causes. She was just her poor heart was so burnt out from all the pain, all the loss and not knowing how to get out of it. And I kept thinking, oh, kind of sounds a little bit like me and my marriage. I mean, I would hear those things with, with the, the stories they were telling about their, their deep unhappiness in the relationship. They're feeling trapped. They're not knowing what to do to get out. And again, remember, it was a very different time for people back then. Even relationship dynamics were much different 
Um, all you have to do is watch TV, Ma- Mary Tyler Moore from that time, and you'll, you'll <laughs> see it. But slowly, I began to see patterns, and I became as obsessed with codependency as I had been with the alcoholic. I mean, I became absolutely obsessed with finding out, well, why does it happen? What happens? What do we do that keeps us doing it over and over? And what can we do that's different, that's better? What choices do we have? I, I became obsessed with everything about it. Just that's where my mind went with it. And eight years later, I finally wrote and sold the book. I mean, it, it, was, it was a long-term dream that eventually came to pass. If you're someone who struggles with getting a good sleep, then you're gonna wanna hear this. You know, we all know that a full night of sleep is essential when we're working towards optimizing our overall health, right? In Cure Nutrition Sleep Bundle, which combines their best-selling product, which is called Zen, and their most potent CBN, it is the answer to ensuring that you get that full night of sleep every night. Now, Zen is a blend of functional mushrooms, cannabinoids, and adaptogens. Well, the CBN product is a lesser-known cannabinoid that's found in the hemp plant. These supplements were designed to support the two most critical stages of your body's natural sleep cycle, the REM sleep and the non-REM deep sleep. Cured's raw CBN oil contains 30 milligrams of CBD, 5 milligrams of CBN, and a low dose of THC. The array of cannabinoids, they all work together to create what is known as the entourage effect, which means each cannabinoid works synergistically for greater efficacy than THC-free products. When it starts to kick in, you'll feel as though you're laying under a weighted blanket. It's wild. And once you're asleep, Zen, which contains reishi mushroom, magnesium, 20 milligrams of CBD, and ashwagandha, to ensure that your body is successfully cycling out of non-REM, deep sleep, into REM, and back again. The best part, though, is that you won't wake up groggy. With this sleep bundle, I wake up feeling refreshed and ready to take on the day. And right now, Cured is extending an exclusive offer to you, my listeners. You can grab Zen and CBD in the sleep bundle and get an extra 20% off Cured's already discounted price by visiting curednutrition.com slash create the love and using the coupon code create the love at checkout. With this extra discount, you're getting 36% off the regular price. That's C-U-R-E-D nutrition.com slash create the love and coupon code create the love at checkout to save that extra 20%. Wow. To put those patterns that you were witnessing in that room into uh, like a, a, a written form so other people can see themselves in the words and in the way that you tell stories and because I feel like, you know, having dove deep into that subject and taught on it too, and and <laughs> through my own <laughs> patterns, much like you, I just found that it seems like most of us, if not all of us, learn codependency. And I think part of that is through just by no fault of anyone's, but that our relationships really, they're, they're, it was hard. I think it's been hard for us to differentiate between interdependency and codependency because for survival based reasons marriage was not always about love only until recently was that really yeah. brought into the picture it was about survival but i've witnessed so many people especially women stay in relationship with people who have no interest in changing continue the exact same patterns are alcoholics make it clear addicts. that they're going to continue the same pattern <laughs> yeah like they're like this is the way it is and i see that on every side of every relationship of gender combination of course but you know i think women have just been more socialized through relationship and media and movies to like be the one who's more of the curator of the health of the relationship and of course safety depends on the relationship having as little emotional disruption as possible and so I look at all that and I'm like, man, we're we're in the we're in this opportunity where we now have more uh, space or uh, resources potentially to mm. and, and to start businesses and all that kind of stuff to be able to liberate ourselves from these patterns because you know what you said about that woman's heart stopping from the heaviness of just the the slugging along, just trying to make these relationships work that when one person is trying to do the work of two, it's impossible. Yeah, no, it can get very burdensome and very disappointing about life. 
And I think when we get thoroughly disappointed in life, it, it, that can be a very difficult thing to overcome. They call it the dark night of the soul. But I was talking to an Uber driver yesterday. I love Uber and I, drivers I, conversations. I, do, I love Uber. It's the best thing technology has brought us, that and, and being able to tour on a book this way. Um, <laughs> but I, I said, you know, no one ever promised us life would be easy, did they? And she said, no. And I said, on the other hand, no one ever told us life would be this hard. <laughs> yes, that's she, true. she said, yeah, you got it. <laughs> and I think for women, well, for men too, because one thing can't change without it impacting the growth of another. We, mm-hmm. we know that, that that's how life works. But um, it's been hard for women. I mean, when my mom, bless her soul, was stuck raising four of us on her own, women could not even buy a home. They could not get a mortgage in their name. I mean, there, there were so many legitimate traps that kept them engaged with people they did not want to engage with, but they, like you said, they had to do it for survival to Mm -hmm. survive. And I think we're still coming out of a lot of that backlash Agreed. in our world right now. Some people are a little more ahead of others, some are behind, but you know, what are the rights of individuals, regardless of their sexual orientation and their gender, in our world? And so as these are in flux, relationships are in flux. That's interesting. Men don't really know what their role is, a lot of them. I mean, you're seeking out, you're seeking out a new way, which is good, because I think that's in Eckhart Tolle's The New Earth. He talks about the role and responsibility each of us will have as individuals, not as people out there doing something huge and dramatic that's going to catch the world on fire, but one by one, finding new ways that actually work, stepping out like you, figuring out how to become an involved father. That That's a new way that's stepping out, that's helping to build our new earth. And I think as in this time right now of great confusion after three years of being on lockdown for many of us, I think if, like I said at the beginning of this interview, we don't just think it's been hard. It has been hard. And we may want to come come out of this like someone being shot out of a cannon, but I don't think that's how it's going to work. I think we can look <laughs> for quieter more doable, more heartfelt ways of expressing how we feel about our part in building the new earth that we're all going to be living in with ourselves and our families that we are living in right now, even though it doesn't feel much like life. Yeah, it feels like a time of coming out that requires a lot of healing, you know, and as you're speaking to you, healing of self, taking time with self, being present with self. And that can feel... You know, in the last three years, I've witnessed a lot of pain, like a lot of trauma, a lot of division, a lot of not understanding one another. And I think it really, what goes on in sort of the micro relational, like vis-a-vis one-on-one experience that, you know, we struggle with in relationship, communicating, expressing ourselves, understanding, allowing another person to be a sovereign self and have their own opinions, thoughts, feelings, and like, God forbid. And that has just become amplified in terms of what we see on social media is the inability to do that, even with someone we care about deeply. Because what I've witnessed is we have made like, if you believe something politically, or you believe something uh, medically or or policy-wise, or whatever it is, that I somehow then put you in a box of who you must be and curiosity goes out the window. You know, from a survival-based perspective, I just get to make all these assumptions that if you think this one thing, then now you're on this other political ideology and, and now we're against each other. And I've seen how much the work for myself too has been really adjusting the way I perceive so I can stand shoulder to shoulder with someone as opposed to face to face, as if it's oppositional, just really realizing. I have a friend who said that once told me to look at everyone as if they are God, like that I can learn from them, that I can grow from them. Now, granted, that can be pretty hard. Uh, but 
it has shifted my life in a lot of ways because for a moment there in the height of the trauma and the, the fear, I forgot to be curious, you know, in, in the desire to defend what I felt was, um, I lived in Canada during that time and it was mm. pretty crazy. Yeah. And, and I felt the, like the lack of compassion to one another. And, and although I really tried to feel into and, and live compassion, there was an angry part of me that had a very hard time that was like, now's not the time for compassion. Like now's the time to rage against the machine. But that's not productive either, you know. Anger is, of course, incredibly important to rescue oneself and to to draw lines in the sand. Boundaries are really important and fueled through anger. That's why you're so sweet. You're a Canadian. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. it. It it has sweetened your energy considerably. I don't. I, you you talk about having that anger, but I don't see and feel that heartbeat of anger that so many men in the United States have now. Yeah, I do see that definitely in the comments sometimes, you know, where there's like a, a lot of name calling, a lot of left. Very vicious. Right? Very yeah, vicious. it's not productive. It's But they're so angry. And, you know, I, I was speaking to someone recently who was just like hating on Trump. And I said, listen, I, I don't care for the guy. I don't, he's not, I wouldn't hang out with him. His way of speaking is not my jam. I am curious, though, mm -hmm. because he's appealing to something in their humanity that wishes to be witnessed, and he knew that. And so I'm like, we have to be curious about it, not just reject it, because if we reject it, we don't learn from it, mm -hmm. you know? And based on all the writing you've done and all the work you've done, where are we at? Please fix it, Melody. Please fix it. <laughs> mayday, mayday. <laughs> I have to say, when, when Trump campaigned on the platform of making America great again. In, in the strange way that my first husband, David Beatty, helped make me great <laughs> by, <laughs> by his uncontrolled drinking and lying and acting out and me blaming him so long for what he was doing until I realized I had a part in it. Trump affected me that way. And the story of that will be in Living by Spirit. Um, mm. I I was pretty much dying when he got elected. And when I read on social media, on my phone, that he got elected, I had a jolt of energy run through my entire body. And I just went, oh, no, 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 no. And I had this feeling that it was a lot of women who had elected him that somehow still found his energy engaging. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we're all attracted to things that we're not going to indulge in from time to time. Yeah. So th that's my theory, is that he got all these women to do emotional thinking and engage with him. Um, I don't know, our, our, whole look, uh, our whole look at the past is now getting challenged too, because... Was JFK another president who did that? Did he play on his charisma and dynamic energy and his history in order to sway the public? I, I, I don't know. I, I was a kid back then, and I wasn't doing this kind of deep thinking. But I suspect that um, Trump trumped up a lot of dreams in people. There's a new saying in business now, overpromise and underdeliver. Right. And a lot of people are attracted to that. I'm personally not, but a lot of people whom I suspect voted for Trump are very attracted to that. I think there's a few parts in there that one is that I find that there probably for a lot of people has been a sense of despair or hopelessness uh, prior to even COVID, you know, and, and that that type of leader appeals to that. Like, I'm going to give you all these things and the world's corrupt and I'm not, and I'm going to drain the swamp. And that's why, you know, when I, as a Canadian, I was super judgmental whenever he was elected. And I was actually in Bali when he got voted in and I didn't expect, I was like, Hillary's got this. And like, I'm sure that's its own can of worms. And I, uh, it's like how anyone took any perspective during COVID 
I didn't, I don't judge people who their natural reaction from being witnessing tons of fear is to go into survival mode and to disconnect from people they're taught are dangerous to them. And I understand that now. And I think of what you were saying about the recognition of being in relationship with someone who's an alcoholic and taking responsibility for your role in that. I think that's that level of self-awareness and self-responsibility that when we wake up to it, it is the paradox of that is that it is both the most empowering thing, this moment where you realize you are choosing your circumstances. And the thing that I find very interesting about that point that I think is a point that's like in the matrix where you decide, am I going to red pill my shit here or am I going to blue pill and, and stay, which I see a lot of people choosing either of those. You know, and, and you know, there's that saying that we change when the pain comes so much that we have to, or we learn so much we have to. And I don't think that's actually necessarily true, but humans are stubborn AF and we like to wait till the end mm -hmm. to begin. But I think the other part of that moment is that it is filled with immense grief because then we realize we've been choosing the circumstance or to participate in the circumstances that we're in. And that, I think, I'm curious your thoughts, because for me, in my own experience of quitting drinking and in my own experience of witnessing people in that moment, is I don't know, I feel like we need a village in that moment to hold the grief with us, to be like, yeah, we got you. And is that maybe what an intervention is? I don't know. But yeah, <laughs> what do you think about, about that? I believe that we do not have nearly enough respect for grief and grieving in our world. Um, we mock old people. We, we mock our president <laughs> when, I mean, I'm frankly astounded at what he's able to do at his age. I feel like he should be hanging with his grandkids. I'm like this poor guy. He should be well, just reading stories to his grandkids on his knee. But yet this, this was his life path and, yeah. you know, a, a, a good hand to him for being able to do it. And, you know, I suppose in some ways that would go true for Trump, too. I can't believe he's still going. That guy is, yeah, he's on another rocket ship. I don't know what he's on. Probably Red Bull. He's probably sponsored by Red Bull. I, I, yeah, I would. I mean, I used to skydive, and uh, those Red Bull guys are, are crazy. <laughs> um, one of the most profound, frightening prayers that I can choose to pray, and sometimes I don't, is God give me the courage to face the truth. Mm. sometimes I'll choose to stay in denial because I don't have that horrendous deep grief flooding through me. But when I'm, I'm ready to step up and do the inner work, that's the prayer I pray. Do you think the grief that comes in that moment is the necessary ingredients and alchemical process for the transformation or is it's it that a, in rage or it's our passage to surrender? So the grief that floods us is the passage to accepting the prayer that you just Pray, you Just prayed for the answer. You got the answer. You didn't like the answer. So then you went on Instagram, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, like we were talking about before we started officially dove in. My hope is that as the age of Aquarius gets underway, we are going to instill better boundaries for our children on computers, on apps, on phones, because like I also said at the beginning, if parents can't teach themselves boundaries, how can they help their kids? I mean, we need that the situation is out of control with social media right now, and we need to do something. Yeah, you said something profound before we hit record, which was that when you were growing up, and this is true for me too, you weren't comparing yourself to other, you were comparing yourself to self. And that to me is is something that a lot of people, even who grew up without phones and social media, still can't, they can't remember what it's like to just be with self, to to set standards for self, to set to see that you're out of alignment with your own integrity, but not to compare your life to these people who rent a Ferrari for a day and pretend they own it. You know, like there's just something really simple about that, and I agree with you. I you said also before we hit record that. Children can't handle social media like they're just not designed to, but adults can. And I think we're feeling this. 
Yeah, I, I, I think it, we may be in for another moment of truth. I don't know how far away we are from it, but with that rise in suicide on social media and the way these kids, their minds are too easily influenced and it's, it's hurting them. I mean, they're doing things because they've seen them done. You know, children are monkey see, monkey do. And we're hurting them. We're hurting them with social media. What do you think will be the outcome if we don't begin? Like, where, what will be the rock bottom? What will be the moment that we turn and we go, oh, I'm participating in this. Like, I'm part of this. I'm in it. Like, I'm, I'm the addict, which most people just see addiction through the face of maybe shopping, maybe gambling, but especially drugs and alcohol. They don't see and the other this. person. They see what the other person is doing. They never ever see their own part ever. Um, it's almost impossible to go out with a group of friends and not see them watching their phone and sometimes engaging with it during the time you're out with them. I mean, we are all addicted to social media. The savior of our lives, technology, has also become the devil. You know, which is what life does. Life is duality. You know, we get the benefits of the computer and technology, but we also get the the difficult parts, the addictive parts, and the, that's what we need to deal with. And when we're in this process of creating a new earth, we need to start setting good boundaries for our kids and maybe even some cases for adults on the computer. I mean, we deal with criminals in all other areas of our life. Why wouldn't we deal with them online? It's it's a little bit crazy to me that we've created this online world that seems so immune from cause and effect. I mean, yeah. they can't they can't catch the people that are running these scams. They can't locate them. They can't catch them. I mean, and there's this whole fiber optic game going on around us all the time. And that's all beyond me. I think one of the best things we can do for both ourselves and our children is to connect with the real world as much as we can, to connect with nature, to have a pet, to go out for coffee with a human, with a real human, not a friend on Facebook. And to just cultivate life little by slowly in the real world, because that's the world we're trying to save, but nobody knows what it is because they're all on their phones too much. <laughs> Isn't that the irony when we're in, like you were talking about the circumstances when you're in them, much like that woman with the five kids who's really just trucking along. I feel like the same thing is happening where we have all these warning signs of anxiety because I had that previously just from being so engaged with social media because my business was on social media generally that I was losing myself within it, not even knowing that I was, I was drowning till I started to have immense anxiety, which I'd never had in my life and realizing that, well, what was new in my life? It was that I had, you know, now over a million people's, and this isn't true, obviously of everyone, but it's like, in my experience, a million people's expectations, that was the codependent part of me of like, I'm going to place their needs as being, I must serve them. You know, I must take care. I must, oh, and I get to do it through an altruistic, oh, that's great. I get to teach. Like, oh, I get to over-function and I get to blame the requests and the needs of the audience, you know, which is interesting how it's easy if we haven't healed. I, I found my codependency went from me and partner or me and parent or me and whatever, mm -hmm. it, I started to play whack-a-mole with it. And it, I healed it on the individual. Yeah. And then the fucker would just pop up in another place. But I found it really popped up. I called it collective codependency, that social media has created this relationship to infinite amounts of people that- That we've never met and never will. Right. And yet we're trying to make them happy. Good luck. Right, right, which is impossible, which is, I think, the medicine, which is really interesting. Like, I found the part of me that needed to be loved, that desperately wanted to be chosen and all those things. I felt that resolved interpersonally 
but I hadn't gone through the full mortality, you know, the full, like, you're never going to actually please anyone. So just live your fucking life. Social media, I feel like has amplified that, which I think is a good thing on some level, but I don't know we have the capacity to hold it in that level. You know, you were talking earlier about, about like, you believe there's God in each of us. And, and that is a very Buddhist concept that we each are a piece of the divine. We each have yeah. a divine soul, a, div- a speck of the divine with us. And in the Patala, which is the building there where the Dalai Lama used to live that contains all their books of infinite wisdom, it talked about at the beginning of the world, all the books in that library contained everything that was going to take place in the world till the end of time. So computers were known about, planes were known about, they were written about before they existed. They All this wisdom was encapsulated for people. And then we were going to be thrown into it and left to sort how we were going to deal with it. So good luck to us. <laughs> They didn't write the follow-ups to those books, like what was going to happen? No, but I did get to touch them. I got to actually touch them, which felt what remarkable. What a tease that is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I couldn't have read them anyway because I can't read Tibetan. If that's the case, then there is a divine wisdom, right? If you work backwards, there yeah. is a divine wisdom that's known about climate control that's known about social media that's known about cigarette smoking that's known about all these other things that we didn't know about yet has allowed them to happen and i have to assume has some sort of plan in mind for us to resolve to come to grips with and the thing i was going to say about anxiety is it's contagious Mm-hmm. And especially now, we're electronically um, connected to almost every human being on the planet through our computers, through our Zooms, through our phones, um, through all of it. So if when there's that much anxiety going on with everyone, which there is, we're going to catch it. We catch it from people's – the things they don't say more than what they say. We catch it from – People being afraid constantly they're going to get canceled if they say the wrong thing. And we all have a bit of that, don't we? Yeah, definitely. And that relates to your statement about codependency on the whole cultural consciousness. You know, it, it's affecting all of us <laughs> in ways that we can't even fully see. You know, we're afraid of saying the wrong thing. We're afraid of, we're, we're afraid. And our hearts aren't open. Our hearts are not necessarily the most open they've ever been right now. Yeah, well, on some level, it doesn't feel, I mean, it literally is not safe to be completely open. And I've been thinking about this a lot, and I want to know what you think about this, which is, I not thought about it in the framework that you just put. Like, I've thought about it that, like, how cancel culture causes us to not share our thoughts, which gives the illusion of consensus. And so you have a dominating thought or narrative culturally, and that is allowed to exist because to challenge it. But I've not thought about it from that relational pattern that if you have a really angry, let's say reactive father or mother who erupts and actually threatens belonging, threatens membership to the house, the the home, the family, you better get in line. And if you don't get in line, the biological cost is too high. It can be death. But you know, to a, to a human, even thinking if I'm not going to be allowed to participate in this social media thing, or all my friends are going to criticize me because I said, you know, biological sex is real, or, you know, I said something that challenges, I've not thought about it from that level that we're basically in relationship with someone. And so we end up walking on eggshells and that is enough to produce tons of anxiety. Yes. Yeah, even at, the whole process can take place without our knowledge, even. So we're just walking around feeling trapped. Right. And afraid to talk. And then it's showing up symptomatically as anxiety, depression, whatever, autoimmune. I'll probably regret saying this after the words come out of my mouth. But, <laughs> w- 
but with all all the crazy um, behavior that we've seen portrayed by people throughout COVID, the actual people I've encountered in my life on a daily basis have been very kind, compassionate, decent humans. I mean, I have not seen all this crazy that I'm told that the world is seeing. That doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that I'm seeing a different side of the culture. Um, and that's re- pretty much regardless of where I go. People are kind. They're not screaming. They're not acting crazy. And you're in Southern California. Yeah. And we got a lot of crazies here. <laughs> much like healing that codependent dynamic, right? Like think about the person who's in the relationship with the addict who's never quitting or keeps relapsing. Can you speak to maybe what is the way out for that person or what it may look like? And then also how that correlates to us on a societal level on social media or or speaking out in groups? That's a very sensitive question you asked about loving someone that might never get clean and sober. Um, yeah. It's one thing if it's a spouse and you can think about divorcing that human. It's another if that person is your child. And I'm seeing ugh, so many people right now caught up with being faced with and forced to embrace the fact that their child is experimenting with fentanyl. Where can you even go with that? I mean, these people are in horrible situations, horrible circumstances. Right. So these are some of the problems we're all tasked with solving while we create the new earth. What is the resolution to, or is it so individual to that type of, like breaking out of that pattern? No matter where we are, and this is not always reassuring, it's where we're meant to be. No matter where our kids are, it's where they're meant to be. Something got them there and there's a way out. I am a firm believer in the idea that we each have our own personalized path to well-being. And we can tap into it no matter how much money we have or don't have, no matter where we are or aren't, and no matter who we know or don't know, no matter who loves us and is doing what we want, and no matter who isn't, we can each tap into this path of well-being. And it starts with a, a pure desire in our own heart to look at the truth and to sort what's best for me to do for myself and for the people I love. I hate to get into religion, but so many people think that we're supposed to just love everybody. and and. I believe that the commandment says love others as we love ourselves, not love others and completely despise and hate ourselves. And I think we've gotten a little turned about on that idea in our world. Uh, I I don't want to get into debating religion. Religion was sent to help us be better people, not hate each other more. Yeah, that's an interesting interpretation of it because I I agree with you. There's something lost in... Like if I post a message about unconditional love, you know, I always add the caveat that it does not mean unconditional tolerance. And actually, it is loving to place boundaries. It's loving to have standards for other people, for yourself, for what you're committed to creating. And, you know, I've had relationship with um, addicts. And what I knew was that my own healing eventually led to, you know, ideally would lead to their healing, but did in some cases that just by me standing in what was true for me and what was healthy for me, and I chose to stop participating in the pattern, that that was the invitation for them, which is not treat myself. It's not a guarantee. Yeah, because in some circumstances it worked and in another it didn't. and, And that felt not reflective of me, but. That can be very frightening when it's our child who's that out of control. Um can be extremely frightening and heartbreaking and more parents than you realize are going through that right now and suffering with it and struggling with it. Um, there are people now who pay people to set boundaries with their own kids. So there's like a person who's like a boundary broker. <laughs> it's That's a simplified form, but it's when these kids are navigating treatment 
And the parent has lost the ability to set a boundary or never learned one with their child. And so the centers have people that actually will set the boundaries the kids need to help them find their way out of addiction when a parent can't. I personally think that's a remarkable gift to people who can afford it. To help them set a boundary so their nervous system can calm down. Right. And so they know their kids are as safe as they have the power to make them. Because the truth is, most of us can barely control ourselves. We cannot control other people, not in any meaningful, lasting way, ever, ever, ever. We can't control people. Even if we're right and they're wrong, we cannot control them. Even if they'd be happy if they did what we said, <laughs> we can't make them do it. I mean, it is, I think, the ultimate human dilemma. It is the ultimate human dilemma. I agree. Because we're faced with wanting the best for someone and wanting them to survive, wanting them to be okay. And yet sometimes dr getting dragged down, you know, like going down with the ship. Getting boiled in that frog water. <laughs> right, right. Yep. And we don't know it till we know it. And then we're like, holy shit, I'm dying. And I'm the dying frog. I'm the frog in the boiling pot. Yes. So, I mean, maybe if nothing else, just hearing this will help people wake up to the fact that they're in a boiling pot while they can still possibly jump out. That doesn't mean we don't have to leave every relationship. We just... It's about our perspective. It's about our consciousness. It's about our belief system. We can start learning more. What is the person I love going through? Do, can I learn something about that that would be helpful? Would it help me? Would it help him? The most important thing and, and very hard for many of us to do is to love ourselves unconditionally. Very hard for many people to do, especially women, I believe. But men, too. To wrap ourselves up with all the love we would give to a newborn baby or to our favorite pet and give that kind of just acceptance and love and boundaries and scolding and laughter and all the things that people do when they love someone or something is such a great gift. But to do it for ourselves, it really does set us free. We pour so much of that love into other people. And it's not until we realize we're sort of vacant of it or, you know, boiling. Boiling in our own self-hatred water. I'm not talking about becoming narcissistic when I talk about self-love. I think it's what kept me from talking about self-love for a long time. My fear that people would think I was talking about narcissism. Self-love is quieter. It's humbler. It's very Canadian in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can get lost in righteousness, though. Don't it's, it's, be mindful. Um, yeah, I lived pretty close to Canada for a long time. Um, it's gentler. Yeah, it is. It has a whisper to it. You know, it's and even um, setting boundaries can become simpler and easier and gentler. We don't have to tell the person what they did wrong and why we're not going to put up with it another day. We we don't have to. That's just going to make them want to attack us. What we can say is this doesn't work for me. This does work for me. Because we can still blame the other person for everything. And we may be right, but probably we're not. <laughs> if we're still blaming the other person, it's going to come off in how we set boundaries. If we're not accepting the other person, that's going to come off in how we set boundaries. So there is a real art to learning to set boundaries with people. Um, and I'm talking about people we are probably going to be interacting with on a fairly regular basis, because if it's someone we're never going to see again, it's not that important, is it? But it's for the people in our lives where we've been overgiving and or we've not been speaking up for ourselves. That's maybe one little thing we can all do is figure out what's causing us stress, what we're doing that's not working for us anymore. and what we can do that does work for us. That's a gentle way to go in and start setting a boundary that we have to hold it up for the next five years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can't let that boundary collapse because then we end up in the exact same place. Yeah. It comes back to uh, what you were saying earlier about um, God give me the strength to 
to let me see the truth or face the truth or hold face the truth. Face the truth. Help me face the truth. Yeah. Because in doing that, there is something uh, incredibly powerful about being able to witness our circumstances from maybe through that prayer, uh, somewhat of an objective lens for a second, uh, mm -hmm. which then requires some form of action to be able to act upon the truth um, or not for a bit. But I that will find. take on its, yeah, that will organically take on its own life it, because it really all does take place within here in each of us. And if we create the new earth, if we all actually step to the plate and create it, that's where it's going to be created from is our hearts. From the heart. I, I don't think we can do it from up here. I think we've tried that. So we'll we'll give this a go and see where it takes us. I wouldn't mind getting back to um, Lhasa and that book that contains all the knowledge just to put my hand on it to see where we might be going. <laughs> yeah, it'd be but nice if you could better. give a premonition and then just yeah. text me yeah. through technology to let yeah. me know. <laughs> I'll just send you a quick text. <laughs> yeah, I'll just do Google Translate of the, take a picture of the Tibetan uh, writing and I'll Google, I'll use AI. The irony of all of it, right? Uh, I know, AI. Yeah, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that, which is a whole other uh, train, but just on how the nervous system, we oscillate off each other and the collective nervous system of the earth. And you invited at the beginning, you know, for us to, we need nature. We need to be with beings. You know, we need to be with our dog or our cat or whatever it is, our cow. You know, we need to be with them in order to feel the heartbeat of the animal, but the earth and have our hands in soil again. And, you know, this, the rise of technology has been so swift in terms of an evolution. You know, it's like the blink of an, it's not even the blink of an eye. It's a nanosecond. I know even. by its own nature, it went quickly because it's technology. I think right. it went faster than any revolution we've already had, but I don't know. I haven't been around for that many of them. And then by its nature, it connects us all to each other's anxiety. Every time it dings, every time Apple contacts us, it makes itself constantly known like a very obnoxious child. <laughs> look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. If you, if you don't listen to me right now, you'll be dead. What else is going on? What else is going on? What else is going on? And I think that's really removed us from the richness of the presence of being with people. Well, and the earth is a living being. This earth we live on is not just a cold, hard lump of clay. It's a living, breathing creature. And we have not treated her very well throughout through the years. She might have an intervention soon. Yeah. She might be already having one. I think she'll handle herself. She's going to have no problem. She's just yeah, going to cough think... and we'll all be gone. <laughs> You know, or she'll just laugh and watch us, you know, the, the cosmic joke that we'll just destroy ourselves, you know, the sort of irony of human. I don't know if you know who Wade Davis is, but he's an anthropologist and he talks about how um, every culture sees other cultures as a failure to be them and that we believe that technology is the ultimate form of human evolution and yet uh, we couldn't be further away from the earth. And there's nothing human about technology. <laughs> right. I mean, they don't even call it writing anymore. It's content. <laughs> That's right. Right. I don't speak. It's a video. And I make content for a living. No, you write. Who are you writing to? Other AIs. <laughs> Other, yeah, chat GBT will be the new codependent expert. I wonder if these entities, once AI starts, will get codependent on each other. Or if they'd have to program that. that that's, that's interesting. Could, that could if be If they're smart, they'd create a hook to catch us, right? To need, we need. If they're smart, if they, I mean, that's what marketing is. That's what. Or maybe I can catch the AI thing and market books to them. But I don't think they have money, do they? <laughs> no, I don't think they do. Melody, it's such an honor for me to be able to have a conversation with you after having your words change my life and, and really impact it and, and allow me to see patterns and ways of being. And the way you write it is such a gift. It's you got humor in there. It's really your sense of humor is wonderful. And um, for everyone listening, uh, 
go pick up a new copy of the latest edition of Codependent No More and uh, 21 other books or something like that. One one plug for the new Codependent No More is um, it's got the best of the old in there. I didn't take anything out that was good, but there's great new stuff in there about anxiety and trauma. Fantastic. Okay, well, we'll make sure we link it out in the show notes. Um, is there anywhere else people can find you that they should know? I, I'm redoing my whole website thing. I've kind of let that go over the years, but I am in the process of redoing it now and getting all my multitudinous sites together. So I don't really have anywhere to send them. And I don't do social media. So Sounds like something inspirational we should aspire to. <laughs> so we'll make sure we put in the show notes your website and everyone can find all about you there as well as wherever books are sold. Uh, much appreciation. Good enough. And we'll see you in our blessed future. 